And let me just get this up. So I do want to welcome everyone. Um, and like I said, thank you for a little bit of patience while we navigated uh, a little bit of a, a technological um, glitch here. Um, but I am thrilled to announce our speaker today, um, Dr. Greg Hendrickson. Am I saying it correctly? Is it Hendrickson or Hendrickson? It's Hendrickson. Hendrickson. Um, who I just learned actually works in Union Square, the PAC building with me, um, which is mm -hmm. uh, you know so lovely to have a colleague so close by. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, his background, his first job after graduating from Harvard College was as a social service outreach worker to older adults in Boston. Um, he had found his calling at that point, and during 45 years in the field of aging, Greg has provided clinical services, conducted research, directed psychology internship and fellowship programs, contributed to public policy, and had leadership roles in professional organizations. He is the former national director for community mental health in the U.S. Department of VA. And when he started in the field of aging as a young man, he could not have imagined a career that brought so much satisfaction and joy. Um, I'm thrilled, you know, he's going to speak to us today about cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, implementation, and effectiveness for older adults. Um, I'm going to turn the spotlight over to him in a second. Um, just if you do have any questions as we're going through, please type those into the Q&A. Um, and then for those who are looking for CE credits, um, that link will be posted to the, the chat. So you're just going to have to watch out for that um, and then follow the link. Um, all right, so let me um, switch the spotlight over to uh, Dr. Hendrickson so he can get uh, get started. Hello, everybody. First of all, thanks uh, to the organizers and uh, Dr. Tofik for um, her leadership of the psychology group. I'm the only psychologist in the geriatrics department in the medical school. So this has been an opportunity to get to know my colleagues, at least virtually, and all the good work that uh, that you're doing. So uh, I am a gero psychologist. Some of you know it's the recognized specialty in in uh, in a by APA now, and we even have a board in gero psychology. And I have been in the field a long time. I was at a, a presentation recently, and someone said, "We've been working on the elderly so long. We are the elderly." So it's been a pleasure for me to work in this field. And so today I wanted to talk to you about, uh, about this topic. And the reason is I came to Mount Sinai about uh, 10 years ago and my boss said, you know, Greg, we, uh, she's a geriatrician. We geriatricians tell the other doctors they gotta be really careful with prescribing sleep medications and benzodiazepines to older adults because they increase risk for falling. And I've heard that there's an effective treatment for, um, uh, for uh, insomnia, go learn it. So I, uh, I actually went and learned it at the University of Pennsylvania. I did the three-day workshop. I did the three-day advanced workshop. I got a year of consultation. <laughs> I sat in with the sleep medicine people at Mount Sinai just to sort of absorb things since this is not my specialty. And although my initial interest was not in this area at all, it's one of the best things that I learned. And I hope that you'll share my enthusiasm about it. So let me share my screen here. All right. All right, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so for those of you uh, who read the Times, a few years ago, there were a series of articles in a section then called The New Old Age about concern about uh, uh, sedatism and hypnotics, about potentially increasing risk, risk for dementia. I think the jury's out, but there is concern about that. Uh, there's concern about older adults who are on sleeping pills and how to get people off, which is no easy matter for many um, primary care doctors. Um, more more on, on sleeping pills and older adults, H hence the concern on the part of my colleagues in geri geriatrics about this as a problem. And generally, there's, they, generally they don't wanna give this stuff to older people because it increased risk for falls 
And uh, I tell you, among the people who have referred to me over the years, uh, there have been there's there have been a fair number of people who have been referred to me on sleeping pills with insomnia who've had some pretty bad falls. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a sleep specialist. I'm saying I have learned a lot from the sleep specialist. So I'm sharing with you what I've learned, okay? Um, and uh, there may be some of you there with background much deeper than I on this to on the topic of, uh, of uh, sleep, but I'm, I've become proficient in the application of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So as you know, there are different stages of sleep. Um, and there are different ways of slicing this pie, and the sleep people uh, slice, slice it much more uh, thinly than I than, than I would. But we know that there's there's light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep, which is dr dreaming sleep. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, as people get older, their sleep changes, uh, so uh, the sleep is less deep. So you're less in that stage of deep sleep during your sleep cycle. Um, you tend to wake up more often. They say sleep becomes increasingly fragmented. <clears throat> Why? <clears throat> I'm sure it's because of the aging brain and other kinds of forces. Uh, sleep times becomes more variable, and you begin to see uh, people as they get older tending to go to bed earlier than in younger years. I used to always go to bed at 12. 10.30 is good enough for me now as an, uh, as an older person. Here's what's called a hypnogram, which is a visual representation of sleep. And at the top is uh, sleep, uh, 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 more characteristic of younger people. You can see the cycling that goes on here. Um, and here is uh, older people. And you'll notice there are more spikes here, right? That is, that is the more frequent awakening, the fragmentation of sleep. And it doesn't, as you compare to here, it's not as deep. So that's just a visual representation of that phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> when, uh, the sleep people who are a very nice crowd, I have to say, have always have many pithy expressions. And one, one is, I sleep better now than I ever will, which is if you, if you start from early life, those, those infants sleep an awful lot. <clears throat> And the sleep changes over childhood into adolescence. Uh, those adolescents seem to want to go to bed real late and get up later. That's the cruelty of sending them to school at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and it changes. It's a it's a it's a moving thing. So so there. Uh, so I think that's important to to keep in mind. Uh, the fact that older adulthood is associated with uh, increasing uh, problems with sleeping does not doom people to insomnia. Um, the prevalence of insomnia more generally among adults is about 15%. Uh, insomnia is not good. It, it, the quality, you, people will tell you it, 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 it uh, hurts the quality of life. It increases the risk that you're, you're going to be dependent upon one of these sleep agents, whether prescribed or over the counter. Go into any pharmacy and you're going to see a lot of products that have PM in them, and that has things and those are not benign, even though they're sold at the drugstore. Uh, not sleeping well is associated with all sorts of issues, depression, anxiety, um, uh, even suicide. <clears throat> Insomnia, for reasons I don't understand, are higher in women uh, and in uh, white individuals than African-Americans. And the prevalence of insomnia uh, doubles by the time that people are older and then even increases. Uh, the impact of insomnia on older adults is more severe and debilitating, G given, given how when old people are older, they, they're, they're more likely to have more health problems um, and things. And so um, it's clearly an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, one of my colleagues calls insomnia is poorly packaged sleep, a chunk here, a chunk there, a chunk there, which I think is, is, uh, is often what you see in people with insomnia who have problems falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up too early, or some combination. <clears throat> the, insom the DSM has the disorder, which is basically these things, problems with sometimes called initial, middle, and late insomnia, that is more than, uh, more than short term, <clears throat> which is called acute insomnia, which happens to almost everybody, and it causes distress. 
So here, when I work with patients, this is one of the instructional materials I go over with, with them uh, that I've been given by the sleep people, the sleep specialists. So th this is a representation of a 24-hour cycle from 9 a.m. to 9 a.m. There are two primary components to sleep. Sleep drive, the biological need to sleep, and circadian clock, that is your body registering whether it's day or night. And so at nine o'clock, with respect to sleep drive, it's, it's minimal. Um, and then over the course of uh, time, it builds up. It, I think of it as a balloon in which there's increasing pressure to sleep. And there apparently is, is a chemical associated with this that builds up. And then as you, if you sleep normally, then that dissipates and you're back to where you started. The other component of sleep, which is circadian clock, um, in the morning, when you're up and the light is in the window, your body says it's day. Over time, as apparently uh, a melatonin will begin to build up, you, these converge and hopefully everything goes well, you go to sleep, and then you're back to where you started. So those are important things to keep in mind in terms of, uh, of what, what are contributors to, to sleep. Um, why do people develop insomnia? And there's a model for that. <laughs> and it's called the Spielman model. Again, all this stuff I learned uh, from, from the sleep people, and it's something I call the 3P model, predisposing, precipitating, and perpetuating. <clears throat> and this represents the, de the, the, the development of chronic insomnia. Over on the left, sleep disturbance intensity is somewhat arbitrarily zero to 100. And let's like say, say 50 is where it becomes uh, sleep problems become clinically significant. This color, bluish, um, represents person's baseline propensity to, in, to uh, um, a waking up, uh, to, uh, 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 to, to, in some ways, potent propensity to biological propensity to insomnia. I generally find people who are more on the anxious side are also more likely to wake up. People vary considerably. There are individuals who would say, now fire alarm could, could go off and I wouldn't wake up. That's not good. <laughs> or, or people say a mouse could run across the floor and I'd wake up. So people are different and there's probably very adaptive to have different members of the tribe having various capacities to wake up uh, uh, at night. So this represents acute insomnia. Acute insomnia is common and is adaptive. It's good to be able to wake up in the, in the middle of the night or have problems uh, of falling asleep if there are life circumstances that are, that are um, associated with. So the green line is a precipitating event, a worldwide pandemic, <laughs> problems with your spouse, financial difficulties, uh, and any of the assorted life problems we all experience for which we're going to find we're going to lose some sleep. But those usually go away and we're back to where we started. However, for some individuals, the problem starts going down, but the, pro the, the sleep may is maintained and over time can become chronic and self-perpetuating. So what are the factors that may perpetuate a, an acute sleep problem to become a chronic problem? Well, people do normal, expectable kinds of things in response to acute sleep problems that, that in the longer run can, be, can create the ground, the ground for developing chronic insomnia. Okay, I didn't sleep very well the last couple of nights. I'll go to bed earlier. Or I'll sleep in. Now, what? In the language of the sleep people, going to bed earlier <clears throat> or sleeping in later, they call deprimes the sleep homeostat. That is the natural rhythm that you develop with respect to your sleep, your sleep pattern. Um, and so uh, people may also nap to catch up on, on, uh, on, uh, on sleep. So what happens is you're trying to compensate for poor nights of sleep by beginning to catch some more, but in the end, what you do is you dysregulate the sleep process. Oh, but there are other things. You start using stimulants. Um, you don't sleep well, you gotta function. You start drinking a lot of coffee during the day, all right? 
And, you know, coffee stays in your system. I think the half-life is eight hours or something. So you may be drinking enough stimulant. So when you go to sleep, it's still in your system. Or because you're not feeling, you're whacked out from your sleep, you don't use, you avoid or decrease physical activity. There's always a good reason not to go to the gym. <laughs> and if you're real, if you're feeling, if you're feeling uh, fatigued or anergic because of your poor sleep, uh, you may not do that. Physical exercise during the day is facilitative of better sleep at night. Um, you start changing your sleep ritual. The, the sleep people say that they're individuals with chronic insomnia who begin to make the bedroom their living room, uh, almost wanting to find a comfortable place, hoping they'll catch some sleep when they doze off while watching TV or falling asleep on the couch. Um, or start doing certain things that they think uh, are associated with increasing uh, 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 the opportunities for sleep. But in the end, you essentially start uh, the bedroom, which is normally an associated with relaxation, becomes a conditioned response to arousal. And so the bed does not say, ah, relaxation, it's like everything else. Um, and pretty soon, the whole sort of behavioral dimensions of what is associated with sleep get mixed up. Uh, then people get increasingly desperate as they get more and more anxious about sleep. Layer, layer sleep-related anxiety on top of this. Um, one of the, the pe persons who, can, uh, who taught me about this, Don Posner, said, I tend to think of insomnia as a kind of an anxiety disorder, because often you see a lot of anxiousness. So people start drinking alcohol to knock themselves out. Well, alcohol will get you to sleep, but it, but it won't um, keep you asleep. And it begins to change your sleep architecture and tends to fragment your sleep. I had a woman a few, a few years ago who had no history of alcohol problems, an older woman, who was so desperate to sleep, she would drink five shots of whiskey to knock herself out. And then she had the fall on the floor because she was basically drunk during the middle of the night. Uh, some people use marijuana. This is increasingly, I hear among, from older adults using marijuana. What Does that help or not? The jury's out on that because there hasn't been really much formal marijuana research, but increasingly um, people start using um, over-the-counter stuff the PM stuff, which for older adults is not good because it tends to dry them out and also increase risks for falls because of that and urinary retention. Uh, uh, you know, for old people, particularly uh, old people well into their 70s or 80s, your body becomes much more sensitive to substances, hence the geriatrician's eye on how much medication you actually need to take rather than what you may come in with. Oh, people start using melatonin. Uh, you know what? Uh, basically, my understanding is most people are taking melatonin as if it, as if it's a sleeping pill, but it's not. They're usually not taking the right dose, and they're not taking it at the right time. So, um, one thing I do, I do want to emphasize again is the anxiety component that's associated with this, uh, because if you're feeling anxious around your sleep, you go to bed. It's going to be hard to sleep because the anxiety says there's a danger out there, and you don't want to sleep if there's danger. So cognitive behavioral therapy is the most highly recommended treatment for insomnia by major medical organizations. The most highly recommended. As a first-line treatment, it's recommended over sleep, uh, sleep medicine. There is probably 30 years of good research, many, many publications uh, on the utility of it, and a substantial number in older adults too, um, which generally show meaningful improvement on the, on the part of most people, who older adults who do it, um, older adults, based upon the research, basically respond as well as younger adults. And the question I had working in the geriatric clinic where the average age is 87, uh, would this work with the very old people? Because most of the studies refer to, to uh, include people in their 60s. Now, at almost 72, those are teenagers to me in older adulthood. So things change quite, quite a much quite much from a 65 to 85. And so I was interested in our patient group, did they respond even though they had increasing health problems and many more medications? 
So the, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, of which there are different versions of it. I learned the one that, that for, uh, from the group at the University of Pennsylvania, and there's, and there's a manual for that. Um, the primary component, components of our sleep restriction, restricting sleep to the amount of time you're actually getting, stimulus control. The bed is only for sleeping and sex, and that's it. Sleep hygiene, basic things like make your sleep environment cave-like, cool, uh, quiet, and dark. Well, good luck for, with that in Manhattan. But nonetheless, you want to have an optimal sleeping environment. You don't want to be you don't want to be drinking before you go to sleep. You you know you don't want to be eating before you go to sleep. You don't want to be going to the gym in the evening, which is going to stimulate you. Um, you want to have a regular sleep schedule. Basic kind basic things like that, and the cognitive therapy techniques, which are basically helping people to manage their cognitions that are related that trigger anxiety. In the version of this that I have learned, that's a secondary technique. It's mainly behavioral. So those are three primary components. Key concepts from a sleep diary. What is a sleep diary? A sleep diary, which I'll show you one, is, is commonly used in the course of doing cognitive behavioral therapy. So what? So there are different acronyms that represent these, these different concepts. One is total time in bed in minutes. Total sleep time, the total amount of time you're actually sleeping relative to the amount of time you're actually in bed. Sleep efficiency, the ratio of the amount of time you sleep to the amount of time you're in bed. 100% sleep efficiency, you get into bed and you fall asleep and then you wake up in the morning and you're out of bed. I typically get people with sleep efficiencies of about 60, 65%. Sleep onset latency, just a, a fancy way of saying initial insomnia. How much time did it take you to fall asleep? Wake after sleep onset. How much time were you awake during the middle of the night? Early morning awaking. How many minutes did you wake up earlier than you intended? Initial, middle, late insomnia. Here is a sleep diary. This is, a, and it's not mine. It's, it's borrowed from the sleep people. But uh, what you do is you ask the person to fill it out in the morning. You tell them not to get obsessional. Your best guess is good enough. Don't write things down in the middle of the night. And as you can see, there are things like, um, did you nap or uh, did you nap or doze? Uh, how much did poor sleep affect you yesterday? A subjective rating. What did you take? Uh, what time did you get into bed? When did you intend to go to sleep? Lights out. How long did it take you to fall asleep? Initial insomnia. How many times did you wake up? How long did these awakenings last? Middle insomnia. When did you wake up? When did you get out of bed? When did you intend to go to sleep? And a few other questions. So they're pretty basic questions. I have an Excel spreadsheet that the sleep people uh, gave me, which I routinely use. And with my patients, I basically, this is very data-driven, hence the capacity to, to harvest some of that information as I did with IRB approval to report on, on outcomes in older adults. Um, so, so here, in a nutshell, uh, what is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia? It's basically eight weeks. Now, uh, you might think, can you actually improve insomnia in eight weeks? Absolutely. If they do it, what did the sleep people say to me? If your patient doesn't get better in two or three weeks, they're not doing the program. That's exactly what I found. Um, so the first session, I do, a, I do a basic mental health evaluation. I, you know, I gather background and for mental health information, a little developmental history, the kind of things that most psychologists do. But of course, I'm very interested in what the sleep problems are and whether there are other concurrent problems. Um, and also how much alcohol people are drinking, um, uh, caffeine that they're taking. And so I get a general report. <clears throat> I give them basic information about sleep, sleep hygiene, some basic principles about what's involved in cognitive behavioral therapy. I also say to them, this is hard to do. You may decide not to do it, that's okay. But if you wanna do it, you gotta do it 100%. So I begin to build a rationale for motivation with this. <clears throat> Some people are in medications. <clears throat> the sleep people said, you can, you, you, optimally you wanna get everybody off the, the medications. So I talked to the patient. I said, "You're on, uh, you're on, been on Ambien for you know five years. Uh, your doctor would like to have you stop it. Are you willing to do that? Um, and if so, the doctor will give you instructions on how to taper it. Okay. So we have that conversation. 
usually in the next session, we um, uh, we then um, uh, a person comes in with the I've jumped ahead here. We come in, they come with a sleep diary. We review it. We we can we can I put, I put the information in Excel spread and I Excel spreadsheet and we basically get a, a, a characterization based upon uh, summary uh, totals in that um, and often uh, by the sometimes by the second sometimes by the third session we begin um, if person people are tapering it will take longer uh, because the during the taper they continue to fill out the sleep diary. So basically what happens, I'll say, okay, you're sleeping five hours a night. So this is what you got to do. Uh, what time do you want to get up? Seven o'clock. So you can't sleep. You, you're only given the opportunity to sleep for five hours. So what time can you go to bed? Two o'clock in the at two o'clock in the morning. And people will that point, that's where the rubber hits the road. Essentially, what you're doing is you're restricting their sleep to the amount of time they're already sleeping but you're forcing them to stay up much later, which builds up the pressure to sleep. So that I say, we want you so dog tired when you get into bed, you're gonna like more likely fall asleep and, st and stay asleep. At this point, some people will say they don't wanna do it. And I'll say, that's fine. I give them some general uh, guidance um, and then they go on. <laughs> uh, but for people who wanna do it, I'll, I'll tell them the two weeks, first two weeks gonna be hell, but it's gonna be worth it. So much of this is basically, establishing rationale to people for why they they uh, need to do something difficult so essentially you you continue you monitor their progress and most people in the, in the first couple of weeks they're doing it show meaningful improvement and by the end you basically wrap it up and and i will say you have all the information that you need in order to handle insomnia problems in the future by the way once their sleep efficiency is at 85 or 90 percent then they begin to add time to their sleep opportunity all right. Your main goal is, 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 is in this is to increase sleep efficiency, not necessarily more sleep, but better sleep. And then people begin to add it and get back to where their biological need for sleep uh, would be. So um, the problem is, um, despite being a highly effective treatment, there's not been a lot of real uptake of this and other evidence-based treatments, as well as medical treatments. We all know that you know something can be, be in a clinical trial, be highly effective, and by the time it gets into clinical practice, it's many years. So this is no nothing different with cognitive behavioral therapy for in, insomnia. So as you may know, there's a whole something called the implementation science now, in which there's an effort to try to uh, build uh, evidence-based treatments, and actual clinical practice outside the laboratory. Um, so with regards to cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, there are three different barriers, which some people characterize. One are systemic barriers. There are not that many people who even know how to do this. About one survey showed 100 worldwide. Um, <clears throat> few venues to learn it, although there are venues. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to, to, to provide some guidance on that. And it costs money. So institutions basically need to pony up the money to have somebody to be trained in this. What are clinician barriers? Uh, you know, uh, doctors don't uh, uh, often uh, adequately screen for insomnia. They might wonder, well, you know, the pills seem to work. Does this behavioral stuff really work? So they may ha doubt, have doubts themselves. In patient barriers, some people say, I'd rather take a pill than to go through two weeks of what you say is hell, because I don't want to do that. All right. So these are barriers to implementation. So this is the, these are the things I mentioned to you. I got formally trained in this. I, I embraced this with more enthusiasm that I, 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 that I, that I could not have predicted. Um, and in the end, it's, it's really, uh, so I did all of these things. I did probably more, I did more than most people would, but in the end, I was really, uh, I became very interested in this. Um, so what I did, so at that time, I was working in one of our geriatric primary care clinics, the Martha Stewart Center uptown. Now I work in, in three of them. <clears throat> so basically what I wanted to do is integrate this into my responsibilities as a psychologist who was providing the equivalent of one day a week of service. So basically I started talking with the geriatricians. I tried to build their enthusiasm. I developed a system for referring uh, to me. I talked with them about about, uh, you know, tapering and what would work, did some presentations. So they didn't, they didn't know much about it, but I began to talk, shared what I had learned with them in order to build a, potentially a group of, of clinicians who would refer to me. Um, <clears throat> with regards to patient barriers, I learned that I need to have a sort of a, uh, 
a whole discussion, uh, which I do try to do with good humor about why this is important. I tell stories. I talk about the sleep people. I talk about what I learned. I talk about, you know, how excited I am about this. Um, so that's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. I say something like, you came to the right place. You came to the right place. And so because people are pretty hopeless and negative about improvement in sleep. And so I want to help uh, uh, to build that. And then when they begin to develop, to fill out their sleep diaries, a means of engagement, I ask them to read the values to me as I put it in the computer. And we can reflect and talk about things in a way that they become more cognizant of their sleep. So over, uh, I have been doing this uh, for probably eight or nine years. I collected, I, I had information that I could assist, patient data that I collected over a four year period um, and then got IRB approval to use it. And so uh, let me, this is, a, this is a snapshot of four years. And just to give you a sense of things, I know there's a lot of information here, but, but let, me, let me just briefly say, during this period, 40 people were referred. Eight weren't good for for weren't, weren't good because they had sleep apnea and they needed to have that treated or they didn't have insomnia or they had other problems or whatever. So out of those 70, 62 were eligible to do it. In the end, 28 said they wouldn't gonna what wouldn't do it. Why? Eh, it's too much effort. Essentially, that's the bottom line. That's a lot of people who said no. All right. Or they had vague responses, or maybe another time, or I don't want to pay the copay, whatever. But 34 people said yes, and only five dropped out during the course of treatment and 29 completed. So that just gives you a flow over this four years of, of people. Um, who are the people who said no? So I basically was interested in looking at different characteristics. The only thing that differentiated the people who said no versus the people who did it was the people who said no were much older. And during the time of COVID, when I went by telehealth, I said, I bet I could engage more of those people because they don't have to come into the office. I mean, when you get well into your 80s, making these office visits, especially on a regular basis, can, is, is a hassle in New York. And here are the reasons that you saw on the slide for why they refused. All right. Basically, in the end, it was like, I don't want to do this too much effort. I don't want to fill out forms. All right. So all the patients that I saw, uh, had, had an insomnia disorder, and they didn't have any other concurrent problem. Sleep, I, I know enough now to ask about other sleep things like apnea, but not, not, but, but not, not enough to know to refer uh, because you don't want to have somebody doing this if they have untreated sleep apnea or other sleep disorders of which there, of which there are many. So what I did is I did cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia for, for these folks. Um, after the initial data, remember when they come in, I do the intake and, you know, they fill out the sleep diary before we get, once we, hit, once we started, that is we started the sleep restriction and stimulus control instruction. On average, it was about six, six uh, visits, six visits. Here, here are the, here's the demographic characteristics of the people. They're primarily white educated women, I began to think, oh, does this work with other older adult age groups? That's that's a question. And most of them were what we call old, old and the older. So two thirds of them were uh, 75 and older. Now these are, I call these are the real old people. All right. These are not the 68 year old people in clinical trials who have one, one medication and one medical problem. They have multiple medications and multiple medications problem. As you can see, in terms of mental health diagnoses, we had a fair number of depression, anxiety, and, and, and things. 10% of them were taking anxiolytics, benzodiazepines, for non-sleep-related issues, and 24% were, uh, were on antidepressants. Um, the, the number of health medications people were on going to the medical record were about um, uh, seven, uh, and they had, in you know, the problem list in Epic, they had an average 11 problems. So these are people who had, you know, meaningful burden of medical issues and medications. How long had they been, been uh, uh, had insomnia? Forever. <laughs> Two thirds said they had had insomnia for more than five years. So this is not acute insomnia. Most of this is longstanding, chronic, what appeared to be intractable insomnia. 
All right. This here, this is a, this, I, I don't, I'm just going to point some things. I know there's all this data. Who wants to look at data? But these are group changes in sleep with different parameters of the clinical data that I obtained. For those of you who know statistics, these were paired t-tests. All right. And these are various indicators. What I want to point out, which is most interesting to me, is the effect size. Remember effect size? The power of your intervention, basically pre post standard change in your standard deviation, which can be characterized by a small, medium, large, very large, and, and huge. My statistics teacher at NYU, uh, Jacob Cohen, who was the best teacher ever, invented this. And if you look over here at effect sizes, you see the primary effect, the primary indicator, something called the insomnia severity index, the effect size was huge. And you can see these different parameters, you get very large effect sizes. But effect sizes don't tell the whole story. But I'll, but I'll, but I'll look at another parameter. So how many people were on sleep medications? Uh, uh, half of them. How, how many of those people stopped the medications before starting? Most of them. And a year later, when we looked in the chart, how many had a sleep medication, um, uh, did not have sleep medications in their EPIC chart? 70%. Uh, so most of the people stopped. Most of the pe people uh, did not have at least a medication in the chart. So what about outcomes? So one way of characterizing outcomes is responder and remitter based upon the insomnia severity index. What is that? That's, that's like a 10 item measure that is commonly used among sleep people, which is some combination of, of patient reported objective data and subjective stuff. Um, so a responder is uh, based upon criteria used by people who do research is if, if you show a 50% reduction in your, uh, your uh, insomnia severity index, you were called a responder. Two thirds of the people did. A remitter is you had a score on that measure that was so low that you would not meet criteria for an insomnia disorder. At the end, almost an equal number of older adults would, would, would be a remitter. That is, they, they would not meet criteria, which is, I think, sort of a gold standard. Compared to, to what most reports are with younger adults, most younger adults, it's about 40%. With this group of very old older adults, we got much higher. So the outcomes here are really great. The sleep people who I Imperia, who taught me this said, Greg, you're getting better outcomes with older adults than we get with younger adults. Now, you would think it might be the opposite, but that's not what I found. And here are just other indicators of reduction, what a 50% reduction in the target system symptoms. So that this would be, uh, uh, you can see the numbers are relatively high. Okay. Um, here is the last patient I treated. All right. Um, and I just want to point out what this is. This is a visual representation of information that was put into from sleep diaries. This woman, um, who, I, who, who, who actually, uh, 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 I, I completed in five sessions. She was highly motivated. The blue line is the number of minutes before treatment uh, that it took her to fall asleep, about a half an hour. The red line is the number of minutes she was up on average uh, during the middle of the night, an hour and a half. The green line is how many minutes she was up earlier than intended. Oh, almost an hour, uh, what, uh, almost two hours. You can see dramatically after the first week how all these things came down. The third week, for some reason, her falling asleep bounced up and then came down. And you can see the, the significant decrease in these parameters over the course of a relatively short period of time. Now you're thinking, oh, this is the best case he ever had. That's not true. This is the last case I had. And this is not, this is not unusual for people who do this conscientiously. So let me. Um, just do some concluding remarks here. Um, in my experience of doing this, again, this is not a clinical trial, but 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 it's an effectiveness uh, uh, report. Uh, CVTI works for the old, old, and the oldest old people. Who people would say, ah, oh, they've they've had chronic insomnia for ten years. If they're they're just doomed to it. That I don't find that to be the case. In fact, I find most people who are willing to do this show remarkable improvement. Um, building motivation is critical to this. You're asking somebody to do something hard. So you really need to engage them with good humor and firmness and firmness. My teacher, Don said, do not be forgiving of non-compliance. 
you do no favor to the patient. Um, uh, most older adults, sometimes who have been on these sleep medications a long time, can can get off them and stay off them. I'll tell you, I I saw a woman last week who was on ten milligrams of Ambien, which is twice twice the, the recommended dose for for younger people. She's eighty seven years old, and has she had a major fall or two? You bet. I have a woman that I'm working with now. She's been on Ambien forever. And that stopped, that pooped out, right? You develop tolerance. She started doing marijuana gummies on top of it. We, the doctor working, we work together. She is off all of that stuff and about to start this. You know what? After she tapered off all that stuff, her sleep is still the same. It poops out. It doesn't work anymore. And now you have all the, the potential risks of falls, which she's had multiple falls too. This can be done by non-sleep specialists, right? This can be done, this can be done by you. <laughs> um, it's important to know when to refer to a sleep specialist. There's a screening form for sleep for other sleep disorders. If I see things of that, I, I will I will uh, that are concerned I'll sleep, send them to the sleep medicine people. And in the end, I am just amazed at how effective this is and how much uh, satisfaction I get from working with people who at the beginning don't really believe this is gonna work. And most people who will do it do show meaningful improvement. So I'm ready for questions and your observations and comments. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, let me try to spotlight both of us. Um, let me see, and add a spotlight. Okay, great, so that was fantastic. So I really appreciate it. Um, we do have a lot of questions um, and I know um, I am actually gonna start with mine selfishly since I'm at the podium here. Um, yeah. So as a neuropsychologist, one of the things that you know I, I work with patients a lot about is, is cognitive changes, right? And cognitive difficulty. And a lot of my older folks um, often have a lot of sleep issues like whether it's deprivation and fragmentation. And there's always this question of to what extent are the sleep problems contributing to cognitive problems? And I do wonder, is there, um, you know, what are your thoughts about kind of cognitive changes, you know, uh, assumingly improvements following compliance with something like the CBTI program? Or do you, you know, um, has that ever been something that's form been formally looked at or, or formally captured? Uh, well, I remember reading a study of people in their 20s um, who were who who had uh, who had uh, some had sleep problems, the others didn't. And those who had sleep problems on measures of common neuropsychological assessments show significant decrements in in cognitive functioning as young people from from insomnia. So it takes and I have had patients who were diagnosed with M mild cognitive impairment who after being treated for insomnia would not have met criteria for a mild cognitive impairment. Plus, if you add to the cognitive this the cognitive effects of these sedating medications, people complain of fuzziness and you get them off that, you get them sleeping. Um, I would expect that you would see, at least for some people, a meaningful improvement in their cognitive functioning. Amazing, okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, I have um, one quest, quest, uh, one comment actually from TBH Total Brain Health also had Cohen for stats with a big exclamation point. <laughs> Wasn't he great? <laughs> um, and then another question from Dr. Jason Stahl. Um, one of the challenges I would like your take on is when practicing CBTI and the patient gets out of bed to fall back to sleep, some elderly patients have bladder problems. So when they get up to go back to sleep, gravity triggers the urge to void. For some patients, when the rate of sleep problems is initially severe, I have found that the bladder seems to condition to getting out of bed, hence waking stimulus control as the patient, patients start to have cognitions and then to have to use the bathroom repeatedly over the course of the night due to this technique. Well, the sleep people say the reason you're waking up, you may attribute it to the need to go to the bathroom, but it may be the opposite. You wake up and then you go to the bathroom. And of course, you need to be cognizant of the of, of the need of how much liquid you're drinking, and also that people can talk with their physicians about ways to perhaps manage urinary um, um, uh, uh, urinary urge 
Um, but I, I, I generally, I, for among people who tell me about this, generally I find at the end, they're not, they're not so much complaining about the need to go to the bathroom, especially if they've managed what they're drinking, uh, at night. And let's see. So the next question is from Molly Sherb, um, for individuals who cannot commit to a full course, um, of CBTI and are just working in individual therapy, what interventions from CBTI would be most helpful to, uh, to review with the patient? Well, I guess you can tell, I, I would just say, uh, as, as, as my teacher Don said, don't, don't half do it with people. And you can provide some general guidance. I, if I would provide general guidance, I would say, have a regular time to go to sleep and to get up and, and set the alarm and get up at the same time. If you're gonna nap, don't nap later than, than, than in the early uh, a afternoon. Um, and if you do have some bad nights of sleep, don't, don't give in to that the next day, force yourself to stay up to the, to the regular time you go to, do you, you normally time to go to bed, even though it'll be kind of hard, but it'll be worth it because that, but you're going to wreck, you're, you're going to write your sleep boat in, in a, in a way that will, that will, uh, will, should be helpful. Okay, great. And then. For from uh, Hinka 01, for individuals who reportedly already know sleep hygiene and practice it, how effective is CPTI at augmenting their sleep by completing the other steps such as sleep diary and such? The sleep people say sleep hygiene is not going to cure insomnia. It's good to do. It's a sort of a basic, a foundational thing. But if you want to address real insomnia, you need you need to use this particular this particular approach. And then um, Dr. Joanne Festa asks, can you provide information for referring patients to you directly? Um, only if they're seen in one of our three geriatric primary care clinics. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's funny, I went into, I, I used a CPAP and I went in to see a physician to, I don't know, to, I needed a new CPAP. And he said, oh, you do cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Can I refer patients to you? This is a, in the sleep in the sleep medicine pra practice at NYU. I don't know. He said the, our last CBTI trained person left, and we can't get anybody, so they can't refer to me unless they're in one of our geriatric practice. I only see about seven patients a week, so you know that's about. So, but thank you for the vote of confidence. <laughs> yeah, it, it's um, actually. Um, Unfortunate to hear that. It's just in general, like the the kind of paucity of specialists across the city, because it is such a um, there's such a need, I think, for for kind of what you do. May, may I may I encourage some of you to do this? I if you have a private practice and you want it to be full, if you if you did this, you'll have a full private practice. If you work with with people with with uh, with health problems, you can improve the quality of their life by doing it. You need to formally learn it, but once you do. Yeah, your your colleagues are going to love you for it, and so will your patients. Mm -hmm. Definitely sounds like it. And I think, so we have one more question left, and I think this is a really good one to um, potentially end um, the Grand Rounds today, um, but it's from Cynthia Green, who is the one who also had your, um, kind of your stats professor. Um, what is the most essential advice you would share with older adults from a wellness perspective regarding sleep hygiene and improving sleep in a way that is scalable? Scalable in what sense? Scalable. Um, that is a good question. Um, okay. I don't know. Are you, is Cynthia? Are you on here? What does scalable mean? I, I would imagine maybe in a way that is um, uh, achievable by then. Maybe if if they have some kind of um, to share as health promotion. It sounds like is what. Well, she's I mean, you know, more generally, uh, I think to emphasize to people the importance of sleep that if people do have chronic sleep problems, they can be tre uh, treated. They need to be very careful with, with things they take for, 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 for sleep. They need to, to follow basic, uh, have a regular sleep time that they address. As I said before, if they do have some acute sleep problems, stay up to the regular time and don't sort of get, 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 give in to things. And, and, and in the end, if, if their insomnia uh, th th doesn't, doesn't seem to improve, well, they, 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 the problem is, I would say, then they, then they might want to get this approach, someone who does this approach. The problem is there are not that many people who know it, but there is at the University of Pennsylvania, a, a provider directory by state and region. And there are some self-identified people who, who, who do this. Um, 
and because uh, people are always saying, who can you, who can I refer to? Uh, and I'm always, a, I give them that directory. Um, and I'm, since I'm not part of the larger community of people who are sleep specialists, I don't know particular people, but there are people who will do it. Sadly, some of them uh, don't want to take insurance. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think because they can probably have, you know, this Manhattan phenomenon of people don't want to take insurance. But I think that, uh, that having a conversation about this is, uh, is useful. And there are online CBTI training things. There's a guy named Mark Jacobson. I think he may be Harvard affiliated who has, a, and there have been, I think, some studies that have looked at the utility of online versus in-person cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. I think in-person is better, but there are people, if they're willing to follow through on um, the guidance that they, uh, that they can get through some online program, uh, they should show, see, see improvement. It's 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 understanding the principles and and following through. The the biggest issue is motivating people to do something that's hard. But as the sleep people say, well, okay, that you don't want to go through two weeks of hell. But if I understand correctly, you've had five years of insomnia, so that's about two hundred and fifty weeks of hell. So uh, you were willing to do that, but you don't want to do this. So anyway, part of it is the framing, the encouragement. It's like motivational enhancement, you mm -hmm. know, that concept. And I find that that's a critical piece to it. And I try when I, as I've learned to do this over time, I try to be anecdotal and I try to be humorous and, and, um, uh, and conversational and educational to try to build some enthusiasm in people who are willing to do it. At looking at the data that I had, if half the people in the clinic referred to me won't do it, what can I do in order to try to uh, reduce that number? And I was thinking maybe something I could do is talk with my geriatrics colleagues, uh, have them work with the patients first and building their motivation to go to me, uh, maybe have some informational things that can be given to people um, uh, so that by the time they get to me, there's some, uh, the peop some of the people who would just drop out on hearing that they had to stay up late would be more likely to entertain the possibility that they would do that. Okay, and so um, there is one additional question from looks like Dr. Grudeau, um, who is going to just kind of ask it uh, live here. Yeah, hi, uh, so I'm Pierre Olivier Goudreau. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Mount Sinai, but I'm also a psychologist specialized in uh, CBTI. Uh, oh, actually, and uh, what do you, my question- What do you think? <laughs> I, I, I well, agree did I, with that. Did, did I say it? Did I say everything right? Do you have a critique? <laughs> no, everything was uh, was great. It's true that the whole the whole package is really needed to 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 really show a difference. Sleep hygiene yeah. is unfortunately not enough to uh, to to change all that. But uh, no, I agree. I agreed with everything. But my question was about tapering off medication. Yeah, uh, I see a lot of patients that. Uh, as a psychologist, uh, I can't necessarily give them advice on any medication. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of do the CBTI in itself without this, like, I acknowledge the use, but I'm not necessarily changing anything on that front. Uh, but most patients actually taper off themselves. So I've seen oh, a lot of people on, yeah. on Zopiclone just stopping by themselves after two, three weeks. And yeah. I put in the chat, there is Helio Clinic. That's where I do most of my uh, clinical work. It's an online uh, CBTI platform. Oh. And um, so it's only five sessions. So uh, yeah. for most people. And yeah, yeah, so they taper off by themselves. So I wanted to hear your, your thoughts on that. On, on Is there like a better way to taper off um, on the medication? What, 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 what I do is, as I sent an epic message to the, to the geriatrician, most of them I know, and I'll say, um, "All right, all right, to have the person tapered off the meds. If so, what's the what is the taper regimen?" And then uh, I'll tell that to the patient, and most oh, everybody nice. most everybody will do it. So I can just I don't have to I can't you know the patients will ask me I'll say I don't know I don't prescribe, but here's and so usually they have a relationship with the physician, and then they say, "Okay," she says, "Take take take the Ambien, uh, uh, cut it in half for a week." And then take the half every other day, every other day, and then stop. 
And usually when they stop, that's when you start the CBTI in which you're forcing them to stay up till two o'clock. So they're so tired. They, 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 they don't even remember that they were taking that stuff because they're so yeah, tired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Know? Yeah, good. Um, well, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, there are not that many people who do this. So feel free to reach out to me if, if you would like. And it would be nice to find out what your experience has been. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah I'll Great. send you, you an email. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Thank well, well amazing. Yeah. Um, so thank you, um, you know, again, for a really a captivating, um, a captivating talk. Really appreciate it. Um, and so we're just about out of time and it doesn't look like there are any other questions. So um, I guess we are going to end the grand rounds here. Again, lots of comments in the chat, um, uh, Greg, just in terms of how wonderful the presentation was and, and kind of practically oriented and focused. And so um, I really do think everyone, um, you know, certainly, certainly enjoyed it and, and learned, um, okay. learned from you. So All if right. anybody is interested in learning this and wants some direction on where, where, where you can learn it, just send me an email and I'd be happy to, to help. It's just a terrific intervention. And Perfect. And, and is your email, like just your first name, last name? Oh, at it's, it's, like, it's Gregory.Henriksen at MSSM at the medical school.edu. Gregory.Henriksen at MSSM.edu. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for attending as well. I'm going to end the grand rounds and just uh, have a wonderful day. Thanks. Take care.